Good evening everyone and welcome to Seminary of the Third Age tonight. Welcome to those of you who are here in person, which is great to see you, but also those who are joining us online and those who will be viewing us on Sunday night at Modbury and Martin's address as well, of course. <laughs> Our acknowledgement of country. Many have gone before who have honoured God by caring for the land in the way they have lived and the stories they have shared. We give thanks tonight for the Ghana people who have held as sacred their commitment to protect the land and live in harmony with it. Now, the theme for the May series of the Seminary of the Third Age is the relationship between religion and ethics. Tonight is the third session in this series, and we're going to look at the topic, Jesus, the basis for a prototype of applied ethics. And our presenter tonight is Martin Sampson who you may remember from several years ago when he did a presentation here. Martin grew up in South Africa where he joined the Redemptorist Order of the Catholic Church, an order dedicated to missionary work and with a special concern for the poor and a commitment to them. He was influenced by the teachings of Rudolf Steiner and became an ordained priest in the Christian community that is the name of the religious body founded on Steiner's insights. Martin was a member of the PCNet task force here and until recently when he moved to Sydney to pursue a PhD in the Christology of Rudolf Steiner. So I'm sure we're going to hear something about that tonight as Martin shares his insights with us on Jesus, the basis for a prototype of applied ethics. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Esmond. You might have to change one detail there. Oh, it wasn't recently, it's three and a half years ago. Oh, that was long. <laughs> it might feel recently, but it was actually three and a half years ago. So welcome everybody, um, and thanks for joining us. I might just move this slide along. I have my own slide on that. So, really, I suppose the background question is, what is the uh, moral development necessary in the 21st century. If we want a, an applied ethics, what do we need to do? Can we do something personally about that or are we just still following codes of practice given to us? Or is ethics now really becoming more and more individuated and how does that fit into um, us who feel ourselves to be in bodies of faith or So I have up there two starting points, or three starting points, because Christianity, I suppose, is quite comfortable with the idea of the imitation of Christ, the Imitatio Christi, Thomas Akempis, where we use Christ as an example for our, our development. But I'm also trying to, and this is through my work in my PhD, seeing that through Rudolf Steiner there's a differentiation. Is there such a thing as the Imitatio Jesu? not just the imitatio Christi, but that there is a sort of a double layer in the being of Jesus Christ in the fully divine and the fully human. And to follow the fully divine aspect of the Christ being, do we at first need to acknowledge that our own fully human being needs some refinement before we can start to go the path of the imitation of Christ? So, in many ways, this idea of theosis, which comes from, you know, might be familiar to you, um, out of the 
Eastern Orthodox Church, which is the, the becoming divine of the human being. So can we broaden our concept of the journey of the human being in that each one of us is on a journey of divining ourselves, becoming more and more holy, we could say more saintly, in Christ, in and through Christ. So theosis in Christ is kind of the, the theme that I'm trying to pursue as this prototype. What did Christ or Jesus Christ in the fully human aspect and then in the fully divine aspect give us as something that we can e exemplify in our own life? But firstly, through a, a journey uh, of our fully human aspect in preparation for our fully divine aspect. Now that might already be pushing some buttons um, in that, you know, I, I said today when someone asked me at another lecture I gave this morning, if Martin Luther was in the room, he might say you're sort of reducing faith and redemption to a personal journey only. What would you sort of respond to him? And I said, well, just because you are saved through the grace of Christ doesn't mean you're saved yet. Because you also have to fulfill salvation in ourselves. And that might be pushing some doctrinal or sort of one's own sense of faith or journey with, with Christ. So, um, this is, I wrote, this is the sort of introductory blurb. The, the Imitatio Christi, oh, I don't have it in front of me, I'm sorry. It's often been seen as a path to salvation. So the question really starts off with, which we'll work with in the retreat, which we're doing. What is your concept of salvation? You know, what, if you had to explain salvation to someone, what would you say? And many a saint is considered to have perfected a Christ-like -like aspect in their life. And the journey of moral ennoblement is part of the Christian life. And how can the ethical life in a time of moral individualism? So, what is moral individualism? We we hitting a time. This is a concept that Steiner also worked. With, Rudolf Steiner worked with very strongly. We, we we sort of living in a time where people are more and more um, not deferring or not structuring their ethical life purely through social or religious codes of ethics. We finding ourselves more and more um, alienated, isolated, disenfranchised from some instructions and therefore in every situation we're starting to find that um, I as an individual need to find my ethical response to this situation which we may, we may find ourselves in conflict then with say our faith community or our social community. Be able to, without much reflection, find many examples in your own life where you've been questioned as to, you know, where you're questioning yourself. How do I, what action, what moral action do I take here in the face of such and such a situation or such and such knowledge? Um, how can this ethical life in this moral individuation still be relevant and approached? So we're going to ponder these issues. By understanding, by establishing and understanding the effects of the life of Christ Jesus upon the human condition. So what did the Christ Jesus establish in the human condition? And, and this is, is, is again maybe a sort of a slightly new idea to go from a transcendent saviour to an imminent or of the trans of the transformative God. So I'm really looking tonight. How do we get from the, the salvation picture of redemption, the, the act of grace, to the individual person needing to find their relationship to the transformative God as well within themselves? So imitatio Jesu, or imitation of Jesus, is a path of inner transformation of a person of faith. So, we have a certain layer of, of who we are as an individual, regardless of what salvation or the work of Christ Jesus in the human constitution might be. Each of us have our own struggles as an individual. Um, you know, we could, we could say um, 
by being individuated in the world today, I have to struggle with things like egotism, self-centeredness, greed, first before I can actually... So that's this imitation of these, that certain human um, capacity that are still very bound up with me that need to be released from something before I can take up this relationship to the past. Yes, I don't necessarily want to go into this tonight, but is there a difference between Jesus and Christ? So even if it's one being, this, we, I refer to Jesus as the fully human aspect and Christ as the fully divine aspect of Jesus Christ in one being. And they, they come at, I suppose those two aspects work together from slightly different vantage points or starting points very different to come at the ethical life from a fully divine position <laughs> from a, from as from a, a fully human position uh, that's a slightly different starting point of it. Our, our fully human position is probably more limited and therefore is less able to access the fully divine aspect um, so the inner path of transformation of the person of faith is as important for the modern ethical as the understanding of the virtuous life in the imitation of Christ, say like St. Francis. We'll come to St. Francis in a moment. Is that going to give me another slide, Fergus? Oh, there we go, thank you. I've gone backwards now. Sorry? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So this is a quote by Rudolf Steiner in relationship to, to, the, to the, the forming of Christianity. And in comparison, say, to other religious formers or people who've been... Given my, I suffer from dyslexia, and that writing would probably be what bothers me said. What was it that he said? <coughs> What did Steiner say? Yeah. Can you go back a slide and I'll read it again? No, this part. This is this oh, this part. I'm coming to this at the moment. I, I, I'm, going to, I'm about to read it for that and so you can hear it. Is that all right? Okay. Yeah, so you don't have to read the slide. You can just listen. So Christ's teachings become Christianity because of his personality. And it is not enough merely to follow the teachings of Christianity to be a Christian. True Christians feel deeply connected with the historical Christ. Individual tenets of Christianity existed before that. So, love one another existed before Christ said that. But that is not the point. But rather that the Christian believes in Christ Jesus, takes him to be the one who represents the perfect human being in the flesh. So this is the prototype that Christ Jesus represents to us the perfect human being. And it's not so much what he taught, but what he was as an essential individual in the world. Steiner's idea of spiritual economy. So in Steiner, Rudolf Steiner talks about spiritual economy, that a human capacity or a, a faculty within the human being comes about because one individual perfects it first. So we could say the Eightfold Path came about because uh, the Gautama Buddha perfected it in himself first. But just because he perfected the Eightfold Path doesn't mean we can do it. We all have to undergo the process of the right learning, the right action, the right speech, all the various aspects of the Eightfold Path. We can't just say, oh, the Eightfold Path is something someone else did. We have to, we have to undergo that. And it's the same with, with the Christ Jesus. Something came about through the deed of the Christ in the Jesus body for the first time, which each of us now have to have in seed form. That's the grace. We all have that thing within us that we now have to unfold within us. So it, that's the spiritual economy that Steiner talks about. That one person fulfills it initially, and then 
in a, in a kind of like a, a morphic resonance within the human being. Each of us have to, through our own path of application, develop that within ourselves too. So I'm going to give us a practical interlude here to discuss something. Um, I want to give you a question because part of this is the applied ethics. And where would the source of the Christ Jesus come from? What was the source of Jesus' ethical approach to life? And so it's a relational, it's a relational thing as far as I can see. And I'm going to put the next slide up. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? This is Jesus and his mother. So the source, I think, of the Christ Jesus' applied ethics comes from the relationship with his mother. So there's a whole Sophianic aspect in the life of Christ that gives him a point of reference or a source point for his, a source point in himself for his moral way of, of approaching the world. And we can see in, in the Gospel of John that in many ways the Gospel of John, not first and last words, but in its narrative, is um, bookended by a conversa two conversations with Jesus and his mother. So the first conversation is at the marriage feast of Cana, and the last conversation is on the cross with John, the beloved disciple. And we could, and Steiner goes there, he says, we could expand this conversation to what else might have happened in conversation between Jesus and his mother because it's obvious if we bring in the Gnostic idea of syzygy that these two beings Mary and Jesus are working in collaboration with each other to establish salvation in the human soul that might be a bit of a radical idea for some people but that the salvation of the human soul comes through the work of Jesus and Mary so it's not Mary gives birth to Jesus and he saves the human beings, but this learning to understand how Jesus and Mary work together initially at the marriage feast of Cana through the whole narrative right through to the, the, the crucifixion and death on the cross is an important aspect for us to, to ponder and unfold. Did there have another question, sorry? No, I thought you put your hand up. Um, so, Rudolf Steiner talks about this conversation that um, Jesus has with his mother. He, he, you could say he imagines or he perceives a conversation before the baptism in the Jordan. That's not biblical. That's not a biblical conversation. But he talks about this conversation that Jesus has on his way to the baptism in the Jordan. And what he shares with his mother is of, of deep um, impact on her soul because he shares with her he's now 30 29 years old 30 years old and he's you know we, we, we see him in the narrative the last gospel teaching is in the gospel of Luke the 12 year old in the temple and the next is 18 years later the baptism in the Jordan what happened in those years those 18 years to Jesus and Steiner asks us to imagine that he underwent, um, you know, he was a carpenter, he travelled with his father, and he saw lots of things. He saw the suffering of the Hebrew people, he saw the suffering of the pagan people, and he saw the, the suffering of the Essene community. And he was deeply disturbed by um, the changes that he saw in the world around him that were al allowing people to forget their connection to the spiritual voices in the world. So I want to ask you uh, to have a conversation, well, actually I just want you to start for a moment with yourself and ask yourself, try and formulate for yourself, when you look at the world today, 2022, May 2022, and you see the things that are happening in the world around you, what causes you the greatest suffering for, for, the, for, we could say, humanity, for the earth, for the creatures of the earth, we can expand that into that. But what really causes you to feel great sorrow for the state of the world at the moment? 
you can you can try and identify one. If you can, try and identify two or three things to yourself. And once I've given you a few minutes to do that, I'm going to ask you to share that with each other. But I want the person sharing to be a, a sort of a merry figure where you just listen and accept the suffering of the other person. It's like, don't question it, don't change it, don't relativize it, but just take upon yourself, this is the thing that causes this person to feel great suffering for the world. The first step is to just for a moment, I'll give you a couple of minutes, I know you probably need you know, three weeks to think about this and we'll work with this in the retreat to a deeper level. But now, it might come up quite quickly. Find that one thing that doesn't have to be the correct thing or the most important thing, but a thing that causes you to, to say, this, causes, this, this experience of the world causes me great pain about the human condition. Just for a moment, quietly, go inward, ponder that in yourself. Like, uh, like a, that our fully human being experience the world, and this is the thing that makes me feel the most sorrow and suffering about the world. I'll give you a couple of minutes for that. If you want to, you can write it down or just hold it in your head. Um, I'd, I'd like this to be something that you that you take with your with you this experience. So, going to receive this gift from another person and you're going to live with it because it's someone else's suffering. Um, this is the source of ethical life. Okay, now, just probably the person sitting next to you is someone that you know. So it's always a question whether you share this with a stranger or with someone that you know because this relationship between Jesus and Mary was a very familiar mother-son relationship. So maybe just turn to the person next to you and each of you share let the one person start, and after a while I'll tell you to swap, so just keep going. And the person, just try and explain this, this feeling of suffering. And the other person who's listening, just receive that into your heart. That this is this other person's reality of how the world makes them feel, in their sadness about it. Not in their joy, there's obviously joys that we can feel, but in the sadness about the world. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to share that. Jonathan, you might have to talk about those. Jonathan. Do you want to share with Fergus, Jonathan? Or, or sort it out yourselves. <laughs>
that that person can bring the, what they're sharing to an end and then swap. Okay, so we can just end those conversations off. Thank you. <laughs> so the idea would be, as an ongoing carrying of that, is to see how that lives with you. Not just tonight, but over the next time, to actually say, I have been entrusted the reality of someone else's suffering into my heart. And that you may carry that. Um, and the person who shared with that might feel comforted that someone else knows. Um, someone else is holding that. And this is the picture of Mary um, in the Gospel of Luke. We, we know that in chapter 2, twice. One at the, the, the visitation of the shepherds. And the other at the, at the um, 12 year old child in the temple both times when she was met with something she didn't understand it says she pulled all these things together in her, together and then pondered them in her heart not in her intellect but in her heart so she used her mind to look at all the things and put them into her heart and the word that is used for pondering, translated into English as symbol. So she created images of these things she couldn't understand. That's a little bit of what I'm hoping to, to build within you as an experience of it's possible for me to receive these images of another person's suffering and to hold them in sort of a custodianship of another person's suffering. And I think for me that's the source point of this morality, this applied ethics, is to be able to, to carry the suffering of someone else without having to comment it, justify it, relativize it, or even understand it. We don't have to try and understand the suffering. We can just accept it. And this was the great capacity of Mary in, in, to be able to do that. So when we're then moving into what might be the, the expression of that, of course, when we come to the realm of virtue, I'm just going to see if I should actually skip over these slides. Um, there's a lot of text there, I'm sorry, but I'll read it all to you. Uh, so, this is a lot of, I'll actually just talk about this. Um, the transformation of virtue, I suppose, is what we're talking about. And we've got in St. Paul, faith, love, and hope, and the greatest of these is love. But these aren't developed in the human being without context. We have the four platonic virtues that precede 
the three theological virtues. And there's the question whether wisdom and courage, um, fortitude, those earlier virtues that were developed in humanity, receive some kind of impetus by working um, at transforming some of them into faith, love and hope. So, for example, if we take the example of, of St. Francis of Assisi, his capacity to develop love came from a transformation of his courage. So, if we look at um, the European virtue basis of culture, it comes out of the warrior class. The Eastern sort of Hindu Eastern is more the wisdom. The Brahman was the, the ethical height of the community. Whereas in Europe, the wisdom teachers sort of disappeared, and it was the, the warriors who formed society. And we're still living in the results of the warrior class of Europe determining what is virtuous. Charlemagne maybe being a, a sort of a classic Christian example of the warrior led by Christ to create the second great empire. However, Francis of Assisi was a warrior. He was born into that. He was in his blood. He was a passionate warrior. He wanted to go on the crusades. He wanted to go out and conquer things. And in fact, when he went out on his horse in battle garb, was told, this is not the battle you need to fight. <laughs> go home. Don't go out to war, go home and fight the battle. And the battle that Francis fights is with his family, with his father. He stands there and he has huge fights with his father's commercialism. And through that, he transforms this external warrior courage, this courage to do things, into through the battle. It's a real kind of living example for us of how this works. He developed his capacity to love. He, you know, he, he sort of burnt up his courage as a soldier to actually be a, a person of great compassion to such a point where he could heal. His, his love and compassion. So this, this opening up of these, these theological um, virtues. We've seen how possibly how faith can be developed through listening to another person's suffering. Courage is an inner battle. So Rudolf Steiner talks about this thing of if, if we want to transform the ethical life, we have to take the external battle and have it inwardly. So we have to take the disharmony that we cause in the world and actually look at it in myself and overcome the disharmony, which would be the overcoming of my, my opinions about things, overcoming my, my desires, my wishes, my passions, all these things that we require within ourselves. And this is where we sort of come to the core of, of these, these teachings, is that the, the, the process of the imitation of Jesus is a pathway to selflessness. So an emptying out. Now, I know selflessness can be a trigger to people because selflessness can connote, you know, being a, a doormat and allowing people just to do to you whatever they choose to. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being very self-consciously aware of what it is that I can bring to a situation, but not finding the source point or the motivation of my action from what serves me. We have to, if we want to create a, mon a sort of a, a process of, of finding out where Christ is a prototype of the ethical life, this was the step that Jesus took, was to, to empty himself. So, in, you know, the Christ emptied himself of his divinity, that's from Paul, and became fully human. But as a fully human being, he, he also had to empty himself of the desire to promote his self in a situation. So there's this double process of... The, of, of of um, emptying out and the selflessness that comes. Um, so when we then transform wisdom, one of the prototypes, we need to try and understand um, how wisdom can be transformed into a, a sense of truth, but not the truth that I want to be true. It's very easy to, to speak about what I want to be true, 
we, we, we research things and we find the thing that serves my emotion and I promote that as a, as a theory of knowledge. Whereas actually what is it that's really true, not what I want to be true. That's again a, a process of selflessness in my quest for wisdom that then also can be transformed for, for truth, not the truth that I want to be true, but the truth. And that opens up the faculty within us of conscience. So hope and conscience allows us. So these, 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 these transformations of wisdom, courage, into faculties of faith, hope, and love, uh, it requires from us a a personal endeavor, a personal commitment to a mastery over that which is my egotistical self-serving source of my action. That's the imitation of Jesus so that the imitation of Christ can continue. So this is a long piece of, of sort of theory again. Um, how do we become aware of God's intention for creation? Does God have an intention for creation? A lot of evolution theory would say, no, that's not possible. The Darwinian sort of, not Darwin, but the Darwinian theories of evolution talk about the survival of the fittest, the, the, um, the, the kind of adaptation to environment. But what we've lost in that is something that Darwin was very interested in, which was where a species would give up something for itself to cooperate with another species to integrate themselves into the environment, like parasites, for example. The host and the parasite cooperate. And he said there's a, there's a, a whole part of evolution where cooperation uh, is, an, is, a, is a, a very essential part of how evolution takes place and that's starting to come back into evolution theory there's a, a real sense of, of of that coming in um, so we see we could describe the whole biblical story from the garden of eden to the, the new jerusalem as um, that the whole journey of humanity's cooperation where it is given from genesis where humanity is in a garden and through taking on knowledge, the tree of knowledge, is propelled into the course of individuation and evolution of consciousness through to the end of Revelation, where the sanctified humanity carries the fruits of the earth into a new heaven, and a, a new earth and a new heaven, so that a city with a garden of healing plants in the form of the trees of life in its center descends out of the spirit world like a bride adorned for her husband. The marriage of matter and spirit through the agency of humanity is fulfilled. So humanity must cooperate with the, the, what's been established through the Christ Sophia and the Christ um, Jesus being. We, we, we have been given something. Matthew Fox, who was here last, was it last year in Sydney? But his creation spirituality is based on his he kind of what got um, excommunicated from the Catholic Church because of his, what, this is one of his books, which was, which was called Original Blessing. And the basic tenet of the, the Original Blessing is that we are very caught up with the um, full redemption part of salvation. The, the, the full redemption that we've fallen and we redeemed through Jesus is, he says, one small part of the pie of salvation. A bigger part of that picture of salvation is this transformative aspect, which is we have been blessed so that we can bless. The human capacity to bless or curse a situation is very part of whether we cooperate in promoting the, the disharmony in the world or the harmony and the healing of the world. That's a choice. That's our free choice. That is what we've been given, is the choice to be a horrible person or a good person. And we have constant choices to do that in the face of what we mean. And this source of the ethical applied ethics comes from this gesture that we have been blessed so that we may bless as, as Matthew Fox has spoken. 
So, um, um, another aspect to evolution theory is this emergence side. So we, we've got the, the sort of the, the, the survival of the fittest, which dominate, has dominated evolution theory. We now see the emergence of, of um, cooperation as a factor in, in evolution theory. There's also the idea of emergence. So I've spoken about that here before, it's one of my pet themes, is do you think um, matter preceded consciousness? So first there was minerals and then plants and then animals and then human beings that eventually thinking and consciousness emerged. So out of matter, evolution takes place because it's, we, we've evolved from matter or does consciousness precede matter? Exactly. God said, let there be light first. You know, there was a thought that then manifestation follows thought. So action, manifestation follows thought. So consciousness is actually the preceding thing, and that emerges slowly. So the emergence of consciousness means that consciousness that was there and preceded matter. It sort of changes your science a little bit to, to just even ponder that for a while. That is Christian, you know, evolution theory. There is Christian evolution theory that said that would, would substantiate that. Sorry? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the word, absolutely, consciousness. If you think of Logos as not just the spoken word, but also as the possibility to to speak. Sorry, I'm really not picking that up. Yeah. Okay, so so not just mutation and natural selection, but also cooperation and the, emer and the emergence from consciousness. Those are being really brought into evolution theory mainly through the discussion between theology, theology and science. A lot of the, the discussion between theology and science does that. So um, I've talked about this of cooperation is the phenomenon of a species of giving up. So this thing of selflessness, of giving up or sacrificing something of itself to cooperate with another species for the overall fitness rather than competing against another to survive at the detriment of the other. This is, I, I, and I'm arguing that cooperation is, um, I'm, I'm not going to read that, um, I'm not going to read that either. Um, sorry? Because I've explained it already. It's kind of just long words to, to, to put there to remind me, and I've actually worked through it already. Um, so what I'm, I'm trying to say that the idea of cooperation is paramount for evolution rather than fitness of survival of the fitness and, 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 and that, that. If we put cooperation as, the, is, is, as primacy in evolution theory, we have a completely different thing for us to look at than our ethical life. So our cooperation with what Christ brought is where the evolution of society and the world is, is kind of finding its source point. So therefore, again, the Christ becomes the, the, the prototype of um, the ethical sources within us because we cooperate with the Christ Jesus in how, and that being, again, it's not a transcendent being that's gone away to heaven. It is an experience of my essential self within me, um, is, is this ex the, the prototype. So we, we could say that the Christ Jesus is the prototype, the perfect human being that I can turn to for examples and for the strength and the courage with which I can then engage in the world in an ethical fashion by using these, the love, the faith, and the hope as ways of, of experiencing my, 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 by experiencing the challenges of the choices I meet in the world around us. Um, Martin, can I just ask, um, haven't we had societies in the past that, haven't we had societies in the past that have been based very much on Corporations such as the indigenous Absolutely. Australians who were very successful 
Um, and haven't we, uh, in Western culture, um, chosen individualism? And that's where we struggle, which I think relates to what you're, you're What saying. do you mean by so, successful? Um, cooperation in the past with certain societies. I've just used the Indigenous Australians as an example, but I'm sure there were plenty of other Indigenous groups. Yeah that also operated out of um, cooperation. Absolutely. Non-hierarchical power and so on. Absolutely. And in my understanding and what I've come to understand, especially through the works of Rudolf Steiner, is that of course there were societies that had better cooperation than what we now express. So what would the, the, the you know, we can list I suppose the destructive disharmony of an individuated society and a, a, you know, to the extent of egotism, so it's not just self-awareness but self-serving self-awareness bringing about a lot of destruction. So a lot of creativity and industrial action has been about self-serving self-interest whereas in the cooperation there's always been, the technology has always been much more involved in um, what I take, I also have to give back. So uh, we can't just be takers, but we also have to, and that's being done through um, religious ceremony, corroboree, all those things where the energies of the, of the land are replenished after we've taken from it, or even before we've taken from it. So what then would be the positive of, a, of an individuated society be? What, what might that be if, if, I'm going to ask this quite specifically, if there is God's intention in the world to be read as how, you know, if God's intention is read through evolution, then is individuation part of God's intention for the, for the human being? So the problem is we have to, um, I suppose have to is the wrong word. Evolution has, the idea of the human being has evolved from being integrated into a blood system where we found our sense of self through our community, through our tribe, through our connection with nature and the environment. That, however, um, is a precursor to what we as human beings are c capable of, which is that each human being is capable of being a complete revelation of the divine. But to do that, we have to be individuated. If I am influenced by another person's opinion of me, if I'm influenced by a church theology, if I'm influenced by a societal norm, I'm not free. I'm still... And there's parts of us that need to be in that because we're not ethically mature enough to act outside of that. Uh, you know, if I meet a person in the street, I might not act in the best compassion to them. So the individuation gives us the capacity to become, and this might again be confronting, to become a Christ. You know, one Christ, many Jesuses, each of us have the capacity to become a Christian, which means I can embody in myself the full divinity of my humanity. But I can't do that if I'm still completely or in part um, have my source point of my behavior integrated in the, in the blood systems and the cooperative systems. So we've needed to individuate with the danger of completely messing everything up, but with the hope that we will be able to make these choices to learn how to cooperate out of um, alienation, really, and isolation. And you can say, well, what's the point of that? <laughs> Why didn't we just keep cooperating? Because it's boring. I mean, sorry, that's a, a very glib answer. But if we just, where would we, pre what, what, what would be new in the world? And if evolution is about bringing new species, so for example, Teilhard de Jean talks about at the end of his phenomenon of the human being, that the Christian person is a new phylum in Homo sapiens because we act in the world with a particular source point called the divine human being within us. 
Um, and, and but we, we have to, to to be able to do that. It seems, and it's argued, that you have to go through the process of of um, isolating ourselves from any influence so that we can, out of freedom, pick up this capacity to love. And yes, through that, there's been a lot of damage, which we are then responsible for. So the damage we've caused to species, so deforestation, to animals, to extinction, to... to sorry? Yeah, to each other, absolutely. The, the, the capacity for us to invade another person um, to their detriment, all these things have consequences that we must now take upon ourselves. And this is literally the, the, the process of, of what Jesus did. He, you know, he took upon himself the sins of the world. And in my understanding of modern ethics would be, I as a human being will be able to slowly but surely, maybe one person at a time or one creature at a time, take on some sense of responsibility to create repair. That's what this co the indigenous cooperation is, that when damage has been done, you do sorry business, which is the reweaving and the healing. It's not just saying, sorry, I didn't mean it. It actually means reintegration into the cooperation, and we need to learn how to do that. How can one do that? How, how, how can you repair and renew and, and fix something that is extinct? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a real problem. Who is fully responsible for that one? Is it one individual or is it all of us? Yeah, these are huge questions. So if something's so damaged that it's disappeared, what can I do about it? So in this way, um, there is hmm. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just a question whether I go to this answer or not. Because in Christianity, this has been a, a bit of a um, an, a a um, something that's been excluded, which is karma. We call it sin in the Western tradition. But if you think of Christ in the Gospel of John, when he meets the woman in, in, the, in the eighth chapter, which is you know, where, he, where this woman is brought to, to him by the men and said, you know, she's done this bad thing. What, we want to stone her. And Jesus writes in the earth. And this is a question. What did he write in the earth? And he says, you know, let those who are without sin cast the first stone. And there's this real, I suppose, uh, metaphorical and... Um, gesture towards how do we deal with the irreparable? How do we deal, you know, when a person's been traumatized or has had moral injury caused to them by another, um, some of that stuff you could say is irreparable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've had that. I was, I was in the military and I had to do atrocious things and there's certain things in me that are irreparable. And yet, we can build around things um, scaffoldings of repair, that won't bring back the loss of innocence, that won't bring back the extinct species. But by carrying the responsibility, we give an opportunity for something new to emerge again. So one of the, these ideas of, of, of Steiner is that um, the, and this has to do with the last two years, and I'm going to put it out here, um, considering it's a progressive Christian network, is that we can't necessarily pay the animals that we've killed and made extinct or experimented on for, for um, steroids and things like that. But in the, in the law of return, if we want to call it that, that you know, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, if we want to put it into Newtonian terms, that if we do something to a creature, something's going to come back to us. And... One of the insights of Rudolf Steiner says that the, the, the way we as humanity will, will be able to balance in the greater scheme of things the, the extinction of species or the suffering that we've caused animals is through viruses. Through viruses. The animal world will make us suffer in return. Yeah? It has already. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So... The emerge, so the capacity, and this is part of our ethical stance, is through, through being able to say, 
we accept, or to a certain extent, how I choose to engage with you know, these, these things that come towards us that seemingly take away our freedom, seemingly um, we can inwardly go in, a, in an applied ethics, how do I get rid of what I think this should or shouldn't be and actually take upon myself that which comes to me. Some people will get sick, some people won't get sick. So, um, but to actually say, you know what, this is, some, this is fair. <laughs> this is actually fair that humanity is being asked to suffer like this because we're not acknowledging that we've made creation suffer. And, and Steiner said we need to look at these kinds of things. As, and this is this inner stance. So the Christ is an example of that. that you know, he, he was unfairly put upon the cross. He was a divine being who had no guilt but suffered unto death, as it says. You know, he emptied himself and suffered, gave himself up to death to create repair. So there's a huge inner um, picture for us of this, this capacity for us as human beings to suffer inwardly on behalf of the other. That's why I asked you to share those things because this is a way to, to, to feel that. That if I can just sit there and suffer on behalf of someone else, I'm already contributing to, to establishing new conditions for something new to emerge in that person's life. I can't take them back to where they were before, but we can create conditions within each other's souls. That was, that's what Christ did. You look at how he, he spoke with people. Um, you know, the man at the, the, the woman, the, sorry, the man at the pool of Beth, Bethesda, and, and the, the, the woman caught in adultery, all these people, he didn't interpret their suffering. He just acknowledged it, which is a very feminine thing. Mary did that as well, and said, yes, it's real. It's real, and I will hold this for you. I will hold this with you. And that allows the other person, and, that, and that's a moral deed. That's an ethical stance to be able to, to say yes to the suffering we've caused and the suffering of other people. It's, it's, and I think that's a very important aspect to, to these things. Um, so the, the ethics of that is given in Christ in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, where he says, what you do unto the least of, of your brethren, but what you do unto the least creature, what you do unto the least of those amongst you, you do unto me. Because... Each of us, so this is the, 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 the new thing that the Christ brings about us. You know, in Genesis we're told we created in the image of the divine. But through Christ, we are given a new archetype, a new prototype. And Christ literally says that in the Gospel of John. I in the Father, the Father in me, and I in you. And Paul says, not I, but the Christ's I within me should act. So if we can start to look at each other as a fully divine or a fully sacred other, rather than a, something that is alien and something that needs to be pushed away, but rather saying, I acknowledge your sacredness, then we start to reestablish the, 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 the indigenous community, the indigenous cooperation. But we're doing it out of us, rather than out of a natural law rather than out of a, a religious or a social law it, the source point is out of my activity and I think this is what the Christ gave us not I but the Christ within me and so therefore when I act to you in a particular way I'm doing that to Christ in you and, and this is the, the prototype that the Christ Jesus is the prototype of the perfect humanity that we're all trying to bring to expression under great suffering, under great, um, you know, destruction because we, we still, you know, riddled with egotism. And that's the imitation of Yezo, is to battle that egotism so that this fully humane being within me can be the source point, through the grace of Jesus Christ, be the source point of my ethical life today, um, rather than finding, you know, how does the church teach us to act towards... I mean, the, this, this, the effective living sense got places all over. How do we, we act towards what's going on in, 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 in Israel or the Ukraine or um, in Alice Springs, you know, in Redfern? I, I don't know where the areas of Adelaide are that we need to look to, but we, we know in every corner of our town there are places where there are people suffering, and how do we stand to that? 
Sorry, could you speak up? Is the place where they did nuclear testing and tried to experiment? Yeah. That place will never be inhabitable again. That yeah, absolutely. Fine, Those fine. kind of things. Absolutely. So the impact of nuclear experimentation in the Anangu lands. And even today, now, yeah. Suffer yeah. Exactly. Their lives were flipped on their heads. Absolutely, yeah. And nothing can change that. And this is why I asked that question, because I think that's an approach to the world, is what is it that causes, when I look at the world, that causes you suffering? It pisses me off. Yeah, which is suffering. I mean, that's a reaction to the suffering. The anger is, a, is one of the responses that's important to the suffering. But if we go in deeply, that, can, that, that, that anger, that suffering can become... I mean, Jesus got cross. You know, he cleansed the temple quite radically. So, you know, they, there's not, you know, we're not talking about pacifism here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so that's what I'm saying. Selflessness, I suggest, has primacy in cooperation. This gesture of selflessness as the imitatio or yizu, is what is the primal experience to be able to cooperate with each other. If, I've, if I have my self-interest as my primal response to you, we can't cooperate. <laughs> we won't. We might to a point, but it'll be, you know, to what profit I might get from you, I will cooperate with you. But that's not actually what we, we're on about. It's, it's this, yeah, so... Um, yeah, uh, I think that's okay. I was going to go into the nature of salvation, but I have a feeling our hour is up. I don't know if anyone wants to contribute. Um, yeah, I might go to this moment as the last contribution. Is that through this thing that I, I read out that for Rudolf Steiner, the teachings of Jesus weren't the most important, but Understanding him as the, the archetype or the prototype of, of our full humanity is what's important. And we, we can see a sort of an ethical progression into the New Testament. So we might say the Ten Commandments given by Moses is still an ethical code from without. It's still appropriate. It was given you know, 3,000 years ago, possibly even 4,000 years ago. Sorry? Yeah, and so then you also come in in the Eastern tradition to the Eightfold Path, which is within the Hindu culture, where a person was noble because of their birthright, their blood right, where the Buddha said, "No, that's not enough. You actually need to do some personal reflection about how you run your how you run your business, how you speak about people. You know, the right the right word, the right livelihood, and the right reflection about my thoughts and my feelings." He said, "Do some go in." go inside and do some reflection find a new source of the commandments and then we have um, the voice of Christ on the Sermon of the Mount specifically with the, with the nine Beatitudes but also if you read the Sermon on the Mount he constantly brings about this change from the law of Moses to the voice of Christ in me so he would say things like Moses said you should not kill but when I speak within you, and that's my paraphrasing, but, you know, but I say unto you, so you could paraphrase it and say, when the voice of this Christ Jesus, the human prototype, the, the perfect human being, speaks with you, even when you get angry with someone, you are already killing them. So he, he can't, you know, he's, and he goes through that a number of times. Moses has said to you, don't do this. But when... Not you, but the I am within you speaks, then already how you behave with each other is already doing that. So he, he, he changed the source of ethics from a commandment you should not, you should not, you should not, which Buddha still also has to a point, to a place of when this voice of conscience awakens within you. Um, then you will not be able to cast the first stone. So that's actually, in, I'll finish with that, is that in that Gospel of, of John chapter 8 with the woman um, being accused of adultery and the men wanting to stone her, 
It ends with that thing of Jesus saying, well, let those, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And then it says, and so they left one by one, led by their conscience. And if you know your Bible, that's the first time the word conscience enters into the story in the Bible. The Old Testament doesn't have the word conscience. It's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It's revenge. Yahweh is pretty brutal. You know, if you've done this, you're going to get it back. Whereas Jesus actually says, let your conscience show you that throwing a stone at someone is no good because you've got stuff to sort out yourself. This voice within ourselves. So where the wisdom, finding the truth becomes this voice of conscience is the hope for the future. So truth, um, faith and hope as really strong, powerful transformations of that which sits within us as our own egotism, as our own personal drive, will bring back. So we go from, you know, if, if you look at a, a sort of a certain point of evolution, at first we were in cooperation with the laws of nature, then we started societies, now we've got to the point of high individuation, and everyone's at a different point with that, driven strongly by the Euro Eurocentric community. But now we need to take that individuation and build new social forms out of these Christian ethics or these prototypes of the true humanity. And then eventually we'll also build a new creation. You know, new species will emerge. I really believe that. I really believe new species will emerge in creation because of how we are with each other. So thank you for listening. I don't know if anyone wants to... Ask questions. Is there still time for questions? Or great to have a question time. We don't have to. No, no. Who would like to ask a question? I'll bring the microphone around. I'm eager, but I might answer someone else to say. You've used up your ice cream Yeah, that's also good. I'm sure you're happy to speak with them. Let's do that. So, nobody's got a burning question they want to ask now? Well, if you do, that's something you do. Here we go. <laughs> uh, when you were speaking of uh, the individual, it struck me that that is an alternative view for uh, the sanctity of marriage, in that uh, uh, you've got the... Uh, Adam and Eve's story, but uh, then you also, that may have been uh, uh, the question that uh, Jesus asked of Mary, you know, am I, am I a bastard? That, as you say, that emptying. And, yeah. and uh, we were speaking about these, some our own concerns, and uh, I was actually in Parliament today, and, um, and it was the last day for uh, uh, Vicky Chapman, and one of her things was about, uh, that she was proud of, was reforming the abortion law. Yeah. And, um, and I think in our uh, modern society with the pill and, and with people like uh, Vicky Chapman, we've forgotten the importance of having a father. Yeah. And, uh, and, and recognising that you, you, there's someone to take responsibility for you. And, I, and, and that may have been a big thing for Jesus. And so, um, you know, to, for two people to, uh, to establish their identity and then come together... It is, is a wonderful thing. Absolute, absolutely. Um, I would prefer to call it committed relationship now because of the context of, of the changing of the nature of, of gender and people's roles in the world. But where any two people commit themselves to each other, they're practicing exactly that, this, this process of saying, through you I will you know, learn how to give up what's most important to me because I love you and because through that so yes marriage committed relationship is a is a, a very intense schooling of selflessness understood correctly and then taking on responsibility for the consequences of what we do with each other so you know when one person decides to do something the other person has to kind of carry the consequences of that with them 
And we say yes to that when we, when we commit ourselves to being in this union, um, which is, you know, I think a progression of the understanding of what marriage was traditionally, which isn't lost in that, but it's, a, it's an addition in the, in, the, in the dynamic of what relationship can be, committed relationship. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Martin, and I think we'll leave it there. If you do want to speak more, speak over supper, but you may know, or you may not, that tomorrow night and Saturday here, Martin is leading a retreat, which I assume is an extension of what you've said tonight, so you have other opportunities. If you didn't know the retreat was on and you'd like to attend, you better come and see either Fergus or me after tonight and we'll check the numbers and see if we can fit you in. Um, and there may be brochures out there if you want to have a look at it to see whether you wish to attend. And the other thing that I'll mention is next Thursday, continuing on this theme of the relationship between ethics and religion, um, Deirdre Palmer, a former um, president of the Assembly of the Uniting Church, is speaking on ethics and its source, freedom, love, justice and peace. So we hope to see you next Thursday night and let's put our hands together and thank Martin for the insights he's shared with us and the stimulation he's given us tonight. Thank you.